It was a wilderness, with nothing but a river running through it. When the two young men canoeing down from Fort Vancouver to Oregon City on a spring day in 1843 stopped to rest on the river's western bank, they were not the first to break their journey there. For long before the arrival of the whites, it had been a favored resting place for the Indians of the Multnomah Band. Why the young men now fancied it might make a good place for a town, we do not know. Perhaps the level ground, the timber stands, the water's depth, or perhaps lolling there beneath the trees and gazing out across the river to a scene similar to this, this great snow-covered pyramid so white against the sky, they simply thought that it would be a pretty place in which to put a town. Anyway, they and their successors did just that, a few cabins in amongst the trees and on the riverbank, a little dock, together with a combination tavern, store and inn at what is now the end of Washington Street. A year or so later, the place was platted into 16 blocks, Jefferson to Washington, and building began in earnest. Yes, it was a good place for a town, the water deep enough to take ocean-going ships, and as important, a low pass through the western hills, the present Canyon Road, into the agriculturally rich Tualatin Valley. In short, Portland became a place where the wagons could meet the ships, the principal requirement for the growth of an American town before the coming of the railroad. But this growth required timber, lumber, and so from the beginning, the people cut the trees at hand, and not only for lumber, but for fuel, to warm them in the dampness of the Portland winter. In time, of course, the nearby trees gave out, and then the people went to the next closest supply, the hills above the town. And finally, both hills and town were stripped. To us, it has a devastated look. Well, to the people of the time, it looked devastated too, and so they soon took measures to reverse the devastation, to green the town again. Their largest effort occurred in 1871, when they planted the 22 park blocks with hundreds of little white staked elms. The plaza blocks near the courthouse were planted too. Though the statue of the elk did not appear until later, there to illustrate the legend that before the town, before the settlers came, these blocks were a woodland meadow and a favored grazing ground for an old elk who lived in the hills above. It was in 1871 as well that in those hills above the town, the people laid out their third park, Washington Park, adding exotic species to its timbered slopes and a fountain too. In addition to these early parks, there was a desire to green the town streets. The results recorded in 1878 by an itinerant photographer who climbed to the courthouse cupola and the roof of the central school to photograph the place to the west up Morrison, to the southwest and newly laid out park blocks, to the south, to the east. The planting of street trees continued. Jefferson Street, 6th Street. In short, by the end of the century, Portland was bowered in green, almost as green as half a century earlier when those two young men had lolled on the riverbank and had spoken their dreams of a town someday. But in 1902, something arrived in town which in time would take the green from the city streets. It was a most curious contraption, and it was called the auto car. Increasing in reliability and affordability, more and more auto cars appeared until finally it was necessary to widen the streets, and with the widening, the trees bowering the streets came down. And for the next half century, downtown Portland was a place of asphalt and concrete. Beginning in the 1950s, however, citizens parched for the grace, the greenness, the leafy solace which only trees can give, took steps to bring trees back to the central city. In the 1970s, the 5th and 6th Street malls were lined with plane trees, and the city forestry division planted trees in the thousands throughout the city. By the early 1980s, however, these tree planting programs went into decline due to a cutoff in public funds. 
This meant that not only were many streets left unplanted, but the damaged or dying trees could not be replaced. The result is that many Portland neighborhoods and commercial areas are still bereft of trees or sparsely planted. It was this dearth, together with the belief that few programs do more to give grace and health to a city's environment than trees, which led Richard Seidman to found Friends of Trees in 1989. Friends of Trees, a Portland-based nonprofit organization, promotes community partnerships to plant, care for, and preserve urban trees, and thereby enhance the quality of the city's life. Since its founding, Friends of Trees has involved hundreds of volunteers to plant thousands of trees in neighborhood and natural areas throughout Portland. Our trees are now flourishing in Elliott, Selwood, Sunnyside, Piedmont, Irvington, Maplewood, Sabin, and in many other neighborhoods, as well as along Johnson and Fano Creeks, and in Forest Park, and other natural areas. How are these thousands of trees contributing to our city's life? For one thing, trees help to provide that elixir upon which all life depends, good water. They do this by absorbing runoff and filtering out its impurities. In addition, trees help clean the air, another elixir upon which all life depends. Also, trees cool the air, tempering the furnace blast of sun-baked asphalt and concrete. The blessed shade they give, dim and cool, providing refuge from the summer's glare and heat. Trees, too, bedeck a neighborhood. They can make a street a tunnel of delight of arching bough and clustered bloom, and may as well screen out what lies beyond, the hardness of structure as well as the ugliness of some. Then trees provide a house for what St. Francis called our brothers and our sisters, bird and butterfly and squirrel, and of course that ardent tree lover, though sometimes for reasons regrettable, the cat. And finally, trees are a place to play. What is childhood without a tree to climb? And what better place from which to hang a swing? As Robert Louis Stevenson wrote, how do you like to go up in a swing, up in the air so blue? Oh, I do think it the pleasantest thing ever a child can do. With all these virtues, it is no wonder then that the market value of a house in a neighborhood with a plentitude of trees is much greater than in a place where there are none or few. But this is not all that Friends of Trees would promote, for we hold the belief as well that community tree planting can bring a neighborhood together, individuals volunteering to cooperate for the common good. How could I make a difference, we sometimes ask, when faced with the environmental degradation of the planet? One good answer is that I can come together with my neighbors to plant trees and make our street, our neighborhood, and our city a better place in health and beauty. And not only for ourselves, but also for those who will take our place after we have left, just as our predecessors did in 1871 for us today. But our children and grandchildren will not enjoy this legacy unless we reverse current trends. We are losing trees faster than we are planting them. As we near the turn of the century, Friends of Trees is looking ahead to meet this challenge by launching the Seed to the Future Project, the largest tree planting campaign in Portland's history. Through Seed the Future, volunteers will plant thousands of street trees and seedlings in neighborhoods, business districts, school grounds, urban natural areas and yards. Friends of Trees and Portland General Electric the presenting sponsor for the Seed the Future project, invite you to participate. Here is how you can get involved. Neighborhoods, business associations, and church groups are invited to conduct neighborhood plantings. Each group will form a committee to organize the details. Friends of Trees project coordinators will provide advice and technical assistance throughout the project. Schools are invited to participate in a special grant program to encourage tree plantings on school grounds. Schools in targeted neighborhoods will be invited each year of the campaign to apply for grants from a special fund established by Bank of America. Grant recipients will design and conduct their own planting project with the help of a Seed the Future coordinator. Natural areas such as the Columbia Slough and Fano Creek will benefit from the planting of tree seedlings. 
From November through April, natural area plantings will involve young and old in these restoration efforts. Contributions also plant trees. Through a donation to the Seed the Future project, you can have trees planted in memory of loved ones or to commemorate special occasions. Why not?